um, you know, we're quite new, and uh, we don't have a whole lot of facilities. You know, we're just starting. And then we're also trying to figure out, you know, where to begin, you know, because Ohio State ha almost has everything. You know, they, they have been serving, you know, state of Ohio for hundreds some years in almost every area of agriculture. So, so the best thing for us is to shadow them, work with them, find the areas where, you know, their, their hands are stretched so we can give them a hand. And, you know, and then in that thinking process, we found an area that, that we could contribute. Um, you know, and we call it sustainable agriculture, you know, where this, the traditional agriculture, unlike traditional agriculture, this type of agriculture, you know, is suited for urban environments. And it's also applicable for, you know, some rural environments where traditional agriculture has been missing, you know, Appalachia, you know, many areas you can find. So we found a niche area, sustainable agriculture, and then we started slowly looking at it and, and, uh, and then trying to find some help. Uh, and then we found that, you know, in urban areas, it's been a challenge, you know. We call it food deserts, you know. You know, a poor family can't, af can't have to travel miles, you know, to get to a grocery store, but then they don't have wherewithal to do so. So, so we found that, and there's a lot of vacant lands in those areas because industries have left, we all know. So there's a lot of vacant land, you know, Food is a way, and there are people, you know, who desperately need food, and we found that aquaponics, you know, is, is ideally suited for such environments, you know. So the initial focus is only on the urban environments, but we realized that there are other areas, you know, even in the rural, you know, where we could find this technology useful. So that's how we decided to, you know, work on aquaponics, but we don't have any background in aquaponics. We have never seen a fish, you know, at Central. So, you know, the only fish I w we have probably have seen is, you know, back home, you know, where we come from, you know, if we swim to an ocean, of course, we find fish there. Um, so we don't have any background in fish. Um, so where do we go? And of course, you know, our Ohio State brothers came to our help, you know, and from there started a great partnership between Ohio State and Central State. Um, they have been so cooperative, and, you know, I, I still remember, you know, again, fish getting into trouble. <laughs> Uh, around 9.30 in the evening, and then I'm on a call, you know, with Jordan, you know, uh, you know uh, who used to work at Ohio State Python. So the collaboration has been extremely, you know, uh, exciting for all of us, and through that collaboration, I could quickly tell, you know, at CSU, we have completed more than 10 such workshops, you know, to give you an example. And uh, OSU is more than 20 and counting, you know. so. Uh, we have four undergraduate students from urban areas who never, you know, he can't even imagine about food and agriculture. So now they're excited, you know. So we have those students working for at least two, three years, you know, they're going into agriculture fields, just to give you an impact of what this project had brought us. Um, we have graduated one master's student, one PhD student, and we are, have two journal publications, you know, which are going to open to the world, you know, the, of aquaponics and the way we, ha we have handled it, you know, using concepts of engineering. Um, so these are some of the achievements that I want to bring, you know, before we get into technical details as to how this technology would work. Um, three faculty were trained, you know, and they are on their way to getting their, you know, tenure. So just to give you, a, you know, so we, center state, exposed to urban agriculture, and then we started improving on them. There's a lot of student training. Uh, um, so through these workshops, you know, we have brought this technology to, you know, urban growers. So just to, you know, give you a few highlights. Um, I don't want to take any more time, but, you know, this is my time. You know, we are at, towards the end of the project. We have some exciting data. So I want to take this opportunity to thank Ohio State, you know, for what they have done over these years, and we hope that this collaboration continues, and then you know we slowly grow in these areas. And then I finally want to say they are leaders in this particular area, and they're good leaders because they want to see Central State become a leader in this particular area, right? There's a few words I want to share with you. Thanks for coming to the workshop. You know you're going to see the results from this work. Thank you so much. Yes, my closest experience with aquaculture and fishing 
was on a fish sandwich. So I knew nothing about aquaculture. I am a horticulturalist. I've been a horticulture specialist with the OSU for 30 years. And uh, back when I transferred down to the Southern Ohio location uh, here at South Centers, we always listened to our farmers. And a lot of our farmers growing the largest specialty crop in those days was tobacco. And in tobacco production, they actually produced their tobacco plants using a float bed or raft technique, just like we'll see tonight and like, like a lot of you all are doing. Um, so those farmers, as you all know, tobacco went down. And now they were sitting on these big greenhouse facilities, big float beds, uh, big static bed setups with all the styrofoam trays and the rafts and, you know, nowhere to no way to use it. So that's where Tom Harker, who's my assistant, he's going to be showing you around uh, our aquaponics setup tonight. We just brainstormed. We looked at this flow bed technique and say, what else can we do? It's basically an aquaponic system. You're, float, you're floating your plants on top of the bed of uh, nutrient solution. So there's where we've looked at uh, cucumbers. We've looked at peppers. We looked at tomatoes. Basic herbs, lots of different herbs, lots of lettuces. So. Over the last 25 years when we started this, we can produce a lot of horticultural crops using that float or raft technique. Um, and then 10 years ago, some of you may have remembered uh, our previous or aquaculturist, Dr. Laura, too. Well, she convinced me. Burgerford, we need a horticulture guy to help me do this aquaponics thing. All right, Laura. So Laura and I uh, we got some funding and started the aquaponics thing. And again, like I said, my closest thing to fish was eating a fish sandwich. So she was the fish girl, I was the, the vegetable guy, and us putting our uh, brains together, we came up with a very crude system early on, but you know, it worked. It was just two by sixes lined with plastic, and we used the float tobacco trays, and we were able to produce a lot of different lettuce crops, because I work with a lot of specialty produce buyers around the state, and specialty lettuces were where they're at, San Filippo Produce up in Columbus use them as a main sounding board because they sell to a lot of white tablecloth restaurants what type of lettuces do you want so we were looking you'll see some pictures out here when you walk down the hall but we grew some beautiful red and green leaf lettuce and so that's what we've been looking at when laura and i started the aquaponics thing we've been concentrating on the lettuces because lettuce has a quick turnaround time those of you that are growing lettuce know you can get a good leaf crop this time of the year, 28 to 32 days, you can really turn that. And even in the dead of winter, you're looking at maybe 40, 45 days on some of these lettuce crops. Um, our experiences, like Tom said, bad. Um, as a horticulture crop guy, I can make, I can control the nutrient uptake of my hydroponic crops by monitoring the fertility, feeding the crop what they need when they need it. The biggest difference between aquaponics and hydroponics is we're relying on them fish to feed and fertilize the crops. So as long as you all understand, when you men marry the two, hydroponics with the aquaculture and make aquaponics, you've taken out that one thing that we can do is by staying up on the nutrient program and the feeding of that crop. So that's probably been our biggest thing, Tom, over our 10 years of experience with the aquaponics is you lose that control. But on the other hand, the work that Rafik and I have done, once you get that system in sync, it really is an autopilot system. The fish are eating, the fish are doing their business, they're feeding your crop, and things will really work. So just remember, those are some of the bumps in the roads we learned. You gotta rely on them fish, and like Tom said, you sometimes see them floating at the top, which can cost you a lot of money. Um, and then you gotta get them fish to be providing nutri nutrients that your crop needs at the stages of the crops grow. So we got a lot more work to do, Rafiq, and we hope some of these other uh, funding uh, agencies that we applied to can come through before we can continue that. But I think we got enough good information that we can share with you tonight that you can, how many of you are growing aquaponics currently or hydroponics? I know you guys are. <laughs> you got some going on too? Okay, so most of you are newbies. Just looking at it maybe? Anybody doing just aquaculture? No fish farmers either? Good, so your closest to fish farming has been a sandwich like me, huh? Okay. So with that then, I think uh, Dr. Reef has gotten us some good data that he's gonna share with us, and you're next. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for your coming. Uh, I would like to show our aquaponics and hydroponics system, actually, uh, with respect to public health. Like, we want to sell our products anyway. Why we are going to do this kind of business? 
if we cannot sell our products. So for selling, we have to say something good things like what we are going to get through aquaponics and hydroponics, fish, lettuce. This is our system. If you look at the photo, this is actually our system photo. So fish farming incorporated with uh, vegetables production. So this is the main uh, system. So what kind of things we are getting? What kind of advantages uh, things we are getting from both fish and lettuce? Because one is vegetable, everybody knows, oh, vegetables, what is uh, special? Oh, everybody says, oh, fish, what is special? Because if we want to sell in the market, we have to tell people like it's, it has so many public health benefit. Instead of taking supplement, we, if we take this, it will cover. So there's the things I want to show something. So this is the first like a result, like crude protein. If you look at the protein, we are eating every day to fill up our protein in the body. So what, how much protein we are getting? So if you look at, this is EOSA, actually this is our aquaponics producing fish. We have collected different kind of tilapia fish from the local market, but we don't know the actual source, whether they are from aquaponics or hydroponics or they're like a, they are producing in the lake or river. So we collected, one is from Bangladesh, one is from China and Ecuador. If you look at uh, the comparison in the bar graph, like three are almost similar kind of crude pot protein because protein is very essential. So through the intake of fish, we are every day getting protein. So we could fill up our protein deficiency in human, our body, just taking this kind of fish. So if I tell other peoples, like why you, are, you will buy this because it is also giving protein, the protein you need every day. And fish is very cheap. Amino acid altogether gives us the protein. So what kind of amino acid is the amino acid? Sometimes we take amino acid as essential every day, like before sleeping, sleep, we take one, or, uh, one uh, supplement, amino acid, because its body needs it. Body definitely as needs it. So, one is kind is uh, essential, one is non-essential because there are 20, 25 amino acid every day uh, actually we are taking in different way from food, food source, drinks. So that, that's why I have put this picture because essential amino acid, sometimes doctors ask please take every night before sleep one of essential. This is like a nine essential amino acid. So, so by taking aquaponics fish, this is our result. Like tilapia, if, if you like take tilapia fish, we are getting, see, so much essential amino acid. So what is the comparison? Like you uh, said means our aquaponics produce tilapia. So almost close. Just only big difference is Ecuador. So maybe you have a question in your mind, why this happens, the big difference, Ecuador, the, from South America, the, the tilapia is coming. Because people used to feed fish, even like, you know, beef, a slaughtering house, a lot of extra skin, bones, they put it directly in the tilapia culturing field. So tilapia takes all those things, that's why so much. There's a big difference. But in our system, we are not giving this. Thing. What we are giving, just fish feed. In the market, available fish feed. These are the amino acid. Histidine, isolation, these are very, very essential amino acid we need to grow up, to prevent disease. Okay, make our body healthy. So we have analysis. This is our, this is our laboratory analysis, not like website. This is our aquaponics producing fish. In the, if you see left hand side, amino. Maybe you have so many times you have taken this kind of drinks. When we go for soccer, when we go for run, we immediately take one 
MNUSC drinks from vending machine beside our field. There is a always vending machine beside the field because blue color, red color, that color containing liquids contain multi amino acid which gives immediately energy so that people can run. So that kind of amino acid we are take, getting from fish and from aquaponics producing fish. So that's the things. If we can tell the people like why you are going to buy because we are supplying also amino acid. What do you need every day? Okay. One important thing is omega-3. Maybe you have heard already omega-3 and omega-6. Is a see omega-3 and omega-6 is essential fatty acid containing omega-3. Sometimes we buy that kind of capsule containing omega-3, omega-6 capsule from the medicine medicine store because it needs, especially for the kids, especially for kids actually we every day give this kind of O because this type capsule also contain also vitamin A and omega 3 and omega 6. Why omega 3 and omega 6 are important? Because it can prevent the heart attack. It's not my word, it's like American Association of Heart Specialists, they recommended like if you take omega 3, omega 6, it can prevent heart attack. So if you look at the data, omega-3 and omega-6, if we take every day 50 gram tilapia per day, we are getting this much, omega-3 and omega-6, see? So aquaponics producing fish are giving much omega-3, omega-6. Maybe you, are, you can ask why? Because we are giving feed. If you give more feed, it will produce, if you, it will give more, it's not a big rocket science, you know? If you give more food, it will be healthy. It will have a fat. Mineral, not only omega-3, omega-6, but all, it also contribute different kinds of mineral that minerals we need for our food digestion, bone development. So just we are showing few of them, like calcium, magnesium, like a, for, for example, sodium is not important for us, you know, it increase the blood pressure. So other like calcium, potassium, phosphorus is very important, like hair, bone, sulfur, Iron is very important for hemoglobin production in the human body. Zinc, copper, manganese is a micronutrient. So these are the things is produced. If you look at like USA, Bangladesh, China, and Ecuador, USA giving, see, significantly higher amount of this kind of nutrient. Sometimes we take this kind of multivitamin containing tablet every night. Sometimes doctor recommend it. Like you take this, you need calcium deficiency, especially for women. Women needs calcium is very much and iron. Most of the women in the world, they are deficient of iron, like because hemo, shortage of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, heme plus globin. Heme is means iron. Globin means protein. Okay, that's that actually called hemoglobin. What other advantage? Why we will produce this kind of lettuce, fish? Until now, I have discussed fish and fish. What about the lettuce? We are also producing lettuce. We produce in our system two kind of lettuce. One is green, one is red. Why red lettuce? Red, if you see something colored, that means it's giving you some antioxidant chemicals anti-cancer producing chemicals. That is the advantage of taking colored fruits or vegetables. For example, carrot. Why you are taking so much carrot? Because it's giving you vitamin A, too much. And also antioxidant chemical. So our aquaponics system producing lettuce, we have two kinds of lettuce. AP red, aquaponics red, aquaponics green. So we compared hydroponics red lettuce, hydroponics green lettuce. If you see, that our system, like aquaponics, red, 
giving much antioxidant and anti-cancer producing chemical compared to hydroponics containing lettuce. That's the advantage because red colorful always is good. So this is phenolic compounds have anti-cancer and antioxidant properties. If you look at this colored lettuce over there. So these are the most important chemicals we are getting by taking fish fillet or lettuce which are producing in our aquaponics and hydroponic system in the United States. So thank you for, for your patience, Siani. Thank you. Hey, you welcome everybody um, tonight. This is really a, a, a nice event to put on and I know people are, have so many questions about aquaponics. I constantly get emails and calls. I know that OSU Extension does too, so um, happy to do it. So my name, again, Jenny Blackburn. Um, I am co-owner along with my husband, Doug, of Fresh Harvest Farm. Um, it's an aquaponics farm in Richwood, Ohio, in Union County. Um, we have been working this farm for um, since 2011 now. Um, I'm also the vice president of the Ohio Aquaculture Association. So <coughs> since, aqua, excuse me, <coughs> since aquaponics involves fish, it's also part of aquaculture. So um, they asked me to get involved several years ago and I worked my way up to vice president. And, um, but I represent aquaponics on that association because it is a growing industry, not only here in Ohio, but also in the United States. I'm going to give you the A to Z. I, don't, I wasn't really sure what to present, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what aquaponics is, how it works, and then a little bit about our farm. How's that? So we do also, um, we do a three-day course at our farm that people can sign up for. They come and they basically get to be an aquaponics farmer for three days. They not, they not only learn about everything about aquaponics, but also how to build systems and run them. So. You're kind of getting a little bit of that tonight. So what is aquaponics? It is the symbiotic relationship between plants and fish that they together combined, it's combining the hydroponics and the aquaculture. We've already established that, right? So, <clears throat> and now the next question everybody says, why aquaponics? In aquaponics, you can grow not only the produce like you do in hydroponics or just fish in aquaculture, but you're combining them. So you get both a protein and the vegetable source. It leaves a small carbon footprint. Um, you use less water, less energy, no petroleum product whatsoever to run an aquaponics system. In fact, with all of the aquaponics um, that you use, there's only really two components that run off of electricity in an aquaponic system. It is your air blower that gives oxygen, blows air into the water for the fish and the plant roots, and then a pump that pumps water back up at the end of the system. And because those are the only two, they are also made very highly efficient. It is environmentally friendly, very sustainable. Doug and I have found that everything we do, we can reuse, recycle, or repurpose. So um, we like that. We're not, we're not adding to a landfill. Um, you can do it in places you can do, can't do traditional gardening. And the advantages of aquaponics, first of all, there's no weeding. Don't get down on your knees and pull out those weeds or rake those weeds out. There's no dirt to get under my fingernails. <laughs> I love that part, trust me. Um, a lot of times what we can do, everything can be done at waist high. So I'm not constantly bending over or getting down on my knees. Um, I don't have to go out and water. I don't have to go out and fertilize. Um, and you can locate them anywhere there's sunlight or artificial light grow year round, great, great advantage. Because in the dead of winter, when we used to do farmer's markets in the winter time, 
before that nine o'clock bell rang, here's our display of all this green, lush produce. And there's the line waiting to buy it. Because they're small, sometimes smaller systems, if you're doing this just for your family, you can do them just about anywhere. Garage, basement. The advantage to growing your own fish, safe, kind of avoid some of that mercury issues that you hear about. Ecologically sound. Um, we're not, you know, contributing to any of the bad stuff that you, that, that can happen. Um, it's very convenient. You've got fresh fish whenever you want to go out and just get some and cook it up for dinner. I did put the word fun in there. And I have to tell you, I have to be very honest. I don't eat fish. I don't like fish. I finally tried our perch for the first time two years ago. And I said, I might have this again someday. Um, but it's really fun to go out and throw the feet in and watch them all come up to eat. So, it, you know, it's a source of, of, of entertainment for me, I guess. But it also helps us to create a food independence. Um, as we've seen over the last year, um, supply chains happen. One of the big things that w Doug and I have seen with our farm is a demand in our yellow perch for, for food. So rather than us trying to sell to, you know, a pond stocking company or a pond stocking farmer, we're now selling to people to eat so that they can eat it. Aquaponics can be really confusing when you start looking at all the videos on YouTube and all the internet stuff. Well, there's this type of system and this type of system and that type of system. You're right, there are many types of systems. So, I'll break it down for you and make it really easy. First one is called a DWC and that stands for Deep Water Culture. They also sometimes call it a RAF system. Do I have a laser here? Yeah, no? No laser, okay. That's what you're seeing right here. This is a deep water culture, and that's what we do mainly at our farm. What that is, is we have grow troughs in our greenhouses that are anywhere from 52 feet to 72 feet long, and they're four feet wide. And they're filled with 12 inches of water all the way down. The reason sometimes they call them raft systems is because they're a raft that have little holes in which you put a pot with a plant in it and they just sit there on the, on the water. They just float in the water on these rafts. We do the EWC because we, do, we have been doing this and we started it out not for fun but for profit as a business. We have found with the DWC that's the best way to turn our product over and to grow more at one time. <coughs> Media-based bed, um, which is the second one here, it's called a flood and drain. An ebb and flow is another word. And basically what it is, is it's a big bed full of some type of, type of media. And that media could be a hydroton, which is an expanded clay ball, it can be a grow stone, which is recycled glass. It could be lava rock. And the reason why some people like to use that type of a, of a bed system is because the, the chemistry that makes aquaponics work, the bacteria that grows, has a lot of surface area on all of those, those things to, in which to grow. It works on the ebb and flow bell siphon system because you've got the water is continually flowing into it and then you have this this bell siphon here so as the water is continually flowing into this bed it's continually flowing filling up with the water once it reaches that bell siphon and reaches the capacity where it breaks the seal and think about it like flushing your toilet that seal gets broken and whoosh, the water goes through. When it does, it also pulls down air through those stones, 
to the roots of the plant. Advantages of um, a media bed is that you can sometimes grow um, root crops better or a plant that might need more support like a cantaloupe or a watermelon. And then there's the NFT system. And you've all heard of NFT through hydroponics. Um, it is, again, this is our homemade version of it. You know, all of these systems you can buy turnkey ready made or you can do them yourself at, a, at a, a quite a, a, a discounted price. We just use PVC piping. And nutrient film technology is what happens is you have your, your channel, you have your plants growing, and you've, you've drilled holes, and you have your plants down in there, so their roots are down in here. And we're pumping a thin layer of water that runs the length of this. And as that water's running, those roots are dangling and t t picking up the nutrients. But because it's not completely full of water, there's the air space allowing air to the roots. So that's what, that's an NFT system. Advantages and disadvantages to all of these systems. Um, can grow lots of different things. You just have to be aware of what can happen. With an NFT system, I will be the first one to say, Please don't do it unless you're only going to grow lettuces, nothing that will get a huge root mass because the root masses will back up the system. It will block the water from getting to all the other plants. And suddenly you'll have 10 feet of nice plants and 20 feet of dead plants. And then there are vertical there are multiple types of those. You'll see a lot of them at the garden stores these days where they have the pretty little pots going. Those basically work on the fact that the water gets pumped up and down through. And then there are wick wicking beds, which are not true aquaponics unless you do what we do. We have a wicking bed here. We have filled it on the bottom with vermiculite. And going from this corner to this corner, we took a PVC pipe and drilled holes in it. We then put this funnel pipe on the end that came up. On top of the vermiculite, we put the weed barrier cloth. On top of that, we put our, our growing media that we use and planted seeds. Now, you're saying, okay, how is that aquaponics? How does it get watered? Do we just pour water in it every day? No. What we did, filled it, we took water from the fish tank, poured it down the funnel to fill it, to fill it. And when we saw that water was no longer moving, we stopped. What happens is that PVC pipe and all those holes leach out that water through that vermiculite. Vermiculite naturally holds water, moisture. It allowed the moisture to go up soak up through the, the growing media that we've planted the seeds in. The only time we have to water that is when we can no longer see water in that funnel. And again, we're using system water. So I told you why, advantages, types of systems, but how does it all work? I told you about water and fish and plants. Aquaponics basically works on a very simple nitrogen cycle. And I'm going to give you the very simplest explanation of that before I give you a more complicated one. Fish eat and fish poo. That poo has ammonia in it, nitrous anomas, eat, and then they poo. Then the nitrous urea eats. And they poo. The plants take up all those nutrients that have been created by all of these things above it, pooing. And the cycle starts all over again. Very simple. That's how I explain it to children. <laughs> they understand that much better than saying, well, there are these bacteria that there's this bad bacteria and a good bacteria. So <clears throat> I have this very Fancy little chart here that I also share with the children because it's colorful. 
but they really understand the other simpler form. So. so when all this is happening, there are parameters that you have to watch. Um, as Brad was talking about when, with plants, you know, he knows how in a hydroponic system, how much to give of what different nutrients. In aquaponics, we can measure those if we want, all of them, with some very expensive equipment, and try to find the right way to add it without harming fish or plants. Or we can just, just basically measure and watch and observe some very critical limits. You're always going to watch your ammonia. That's probably number one. You're always going to watch your pH of your water. Your dissolved oxygen is extremely important. The temperature of your system, sorry, I went a little fast there, and the temperature of your system. So we're going to start with ammonia because that's where it all starts. It depends on where you are in your system. So like when you're starting up your system, you're measuring it probably three, four times a day. You're a year into your system, you're probably once a day. You're 11 years into your system, you figured out ways to tell if there's an imbalance. So you're only measuring every so often. I'll be very honest. So many people, when they talk about aquaponics and they talk about water testing, you know, the, the academic people over here might be saying, Jenny, no, 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 don't tell them that. I'm just going to tell you from experience, that's what really ha ends up happening. That's the realistic side of it. If it's your business and how you're running it, it's going to come down to that. And I'm, I'm not saying that because that's, that's what we, I mean, we do it. Yes, that's what we do. We're not the only ones who are doing it. <laughs> so. Ammonia comes off a of fish through all sorts of their waste, whether it's solid, liquid, but they also respirate through their gills ammonia. Normal ranges um, it's for oxygen or for ammonia when you're testing, if you're testing it, once you have a good, healthy, mature system that's functioning, it should be zero to less than one part per million. If you have extremely high, starting at about three and up, it's very toxic to fish, and it could kill your fish very quickly. The bacteria, the next thing that comes along from this ammonia, right? The nitrosomonas convert the, the ammonia into nitrite. Then nitrosuria comes along and converts the nitrites to nitrates. Academics, am I saying those right? Okay, <laughs> just want to make sure because sometimes I don't. Um, both of these are oxygen dependent organisms. So they are very susceptible to that whole ammonia thing too because if they're not getting oxygen and there's too much ammonia, it's not going to let them do their job. Nitrates and ni nitrites and nitrates. I always get them confused thinking the traits come before the trites, but it's the trites come before the traits. I'm just being very honest here. <laughs> so normal operating limits for the nitrites should be zero to less than one. Um, the reason is nitrites, again, can be very toxic to fish and to the bacteria that's trying to form or has formed. So. If you get anything on nitrites over six parts per million, um, that means that the molecules attach themselves to the hemoglobin of the fish, and it compromises their ability to take in oxygen. So, the nitrites, their normal operating limits, anything above 10 is great. It doesn't matter, it could be 200. That means you have active, live, feeding bacteria producing nutrients for your plant. So all of this happens within a biofilter. What is a biofilter? 
It's just the place where it all takes place. Um, you'll hear a lot of people saying, well, when you build a system, you have to put a biofilter on. Yes and no, depending on what kind of system and how you're building it. But really, your biofilter can be your media bed, if that's what it is, because guess what? All that bacteria is attaching itself and growing. And it's all surfaces in your system. It's your wrap, the underneath of your wrap. It's even your plant root your fish tank size, they all become your biofilters because once that bacteria starts growing and producing those nutrients, it attaches to everything so that it can survive and it can also take up that, those, that ammonia and feed itself and keep going. pH is another critical thing to watch. Um, ideal range for fish, 6.5 to 8. Some fish, depending on what species you're using, could go a little bit higher or a little bit lower and be okay, but could be unhealthy long term. Changes, if you're making changes to pH in your system, it has to be very gradual. No sudden moves, like let's not take it from 1 to 8 overnight. Um, extreme pH, 9, 10, 11, is going to be very, very toxic and harmful both plants and fish. Plants prefer the 5 to 7 range. Some nutrients become available and get locked out at either the extreme low or the extreme high. And the lockout can look different, but usually is observable in plants that appear to have a nutrient deficiency, such as usually you have a nice green plant that suddenly turns yellow. Um, the bacteria, they also thrive on a pH that's between 6 and 8. So they're all together. And if you're doing a media bed and you decide you want to put worms in there to help with the whole process and let those worms break down some of the uh, solids that might flow into it, red wiggler worms, they also like that pH level. Now, Again, remember, we started in 2011. We have fought pH every day until Charlie Schultz, if you've, heard, if you've done any research on aquaponics, you've heard that name. He's now in New Mexico, Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, and runs their program out there. He came to our farm, um, and we were talking to him about it because our pH comes out of our well water at 8, just around 8, sometimes a little less. And we told him, like, we tried to lower it, get it down to 7, because everybody says, aquaponics, it has to be 7. And Charlie said, stop fighting your pH. It comes out at what it comes out. It's not going to go down for you unless you're going to fight it every day and you run the risk of killing fish and killing plants and killing your bacteria. He said, just leave your pH alone, keep your system clean. And what he means by clean is make sure your fish are healthy, you're cleaning up the solids, um, all of that. Keep your water flowing. So that's what we do. We don't fight it anymore, and we are doing just fine. Plants are growing like crazy. Natural trend is to trend down, which is kind of interesting. And I have friends who have their pH naturally trend down. And they're like, I can't get it back up. I can't get it back up. And I'm just like, is, are, your, are your fish okay? Are your plants okay? Well, yeah. And I'm like, then don't worry about it. When the pH trends up, so if our pH ever does go up above 8, that means that there has become an anaerobic zone somewhere, um, or something has gotten into the system that's buffering it, and that's when you have to start and figure out what it is. A lot of times, if it is an anaerobic zone, it's in our media bed, because so much stuff has gotten in there, the worms can't take care of it, and there's no oxygen getting to it. I just 
said all of that, didn't I? <laughs> so the oxygen isn't being absorbed. It's not. It's giving off the ammonia, which is raising everything high. Poor plant growth will start too. My next measure that I said you always have to you have to watch is dissolved oxygen. That's the measure of the amount of oxygen in parts per million in the water. That is what the fish breathe with. So remember I said anything above a six is really good. Anything below three is dangerously low. How do you get dissolved oxygen into your waters? You use an air blower, an air stone. Um, and it is necessary no matter what your stocking density is with your fish. Both your plant roots need oxygen to grow as well as your fish. And the reason I'm talking about the plant roots needing the oxygen, I'll give you an example. As you are all probably driving here, you probably pass a lot of fields where beans and corn are growing. And maybe you saw this really lush field of soybeans growing, but there's one area that there's nothing growing, but there's water kind of standing or it looks really muddy. It's not because the farmer didn't plant seeds there. The farmer did plant seeds there. But in hard rains, it floods there because that's where the water goes to that lowest point of that field apparently and it has drowned the seeds. So if the farmer could go back and somehow get some oxygen to those seeds while that water standing there, his plants would grow. So thinking about that, that makes sense of why we can grow in water. We don't have to have soil. Everybody says, no, you have to have soil to grow. No, you don't. You have to have water and you have to have oxygen. And sunshine helps, too. Um, you can also create um, dissolved oxygen in water just by moving the surface of the water. You know how you go and you tap on water and splash around. That actually is creating oxygen in the water bubbles. So and you can do that by doing stuff like aeration bars, which are very simple to make. This is not one of ours, but this is a PVC pipe with just holes drilled in it. The water, a small pump is pumping water into there so that the water goes in and comes down and makes splashes. Kind of like when you see people who have um, ponds in their yard and they have all these fountains. That's what they're doing. They're, they're aerating that pond. They probably have some type of fish in there. DO limits for fish. We already talked about that. That above six is good, you need to watch. Don't ever measure your DO after you feed because it will drop immediately because they're in a frenzy and they're using a lot of energy and they need more oxygen to eat. Um, a way to kind of say that, you know, they're, they're exhibiting signs of, of low oxygen is that they're coming up to the surface, surface of the water kind of gulping. Just don't mistake that as they're like, I want feed, I want feed. It's very distinct. Um, very rare that they get too much oxygen. I mean, what we've learned and what our fish experts have told us, our fish guy that we depend on for all sources, I said, you can't give them too much oxygen unless you're blowing them out of the water with it. So, but in rare cases, yes, you can. Next important thing is temperature. I mean, that's kind of a given when you're growing something, whether you're indoors, outdoors, aquaponics, hydroponics, out in the ground, temperature, right? Um, it's problematic for fish, plants, and bacteria. Um, cold tempers, temperatures are usually the greatest concern. Um, experience, Doug and I have experienced cold temperatures way too many times. We do heat our, our greenhouses with um, a wood burning boiler system, coal burning boiler system. 
However, before we had that, we had propane. And when you have negative 20 degree temperatures, do you think propane comes out of a tank? If you have a low propane tank, it won't go anywhere. It's too cold to raise that, get that up out of that tank. So we had overnight whole, whole greenhouse full of lettuce die. Frozen lettuce, have you ever seen it? Anybody? Yeah, it's beautiful. Something that I want to take to the farmer's market, for sure. <laughs> um, some fish are cold tolerant. Um, koi, catfish are examples. Tilapia are not cold tolerant. These guys over here will tell you. You get them at 70 to 90 degrees, they're so happy. They'll start dying below 60. Um, bacteria reproduction actually cuts in half when the temperature in the water goes below 64 and it basically stops under 40 and definitely kills it at freeze when it freezes. Again, plants can be affected by the extremes and you can do some things to, to help with that. In the summer, like these are very hot days, I mean, we grow in three greenhouses, plastic covering. We have our sides up, we have fans going, so we help, we help to circulate the air. We have big exhaust fans at the top pulling stuff out. We're doing our best. Um, there are some cooling walls that you can get. Um, we have actually seen those working. Oh gosh, would they be so nice? but we are, already, we are already providing a humid environment and you're gonna add more humidity with a cooling wall because it works just like a, an air conditioner basically with, with water circulating. Um, and, the, and the cold, you know, hoop houses. That's why a lot of um, traditional farmers, you know, that grow, they'll use hoop houses to extend seasons because having a hoop house with that plastic, when your temperatures get a little bit cooler, the sun comes out, it heats up inside and helps to, to hold in that heat. So we're talking about all this water and these parameters, you know, the ammonia in it, the BO. All that can't happen unless you have a good water source in your system. Ag water or your irrigation water, if you're by a farm and you say, oh, can I, you know, fill my system with your, your irrigation water? That is a big no. Don't do it because they're a traditional farmer. What are they putting on their crops? Whatever they're putting on their crops is in that irrigation water. Um, city water is okay to use, but it does have chlorine in it. You have to have it tested or ask the water department what kind of chlorine is, is in it. You can either use a chemical to dechlorinate it or you can simply fill a tank and let it sit for a few days. And that, that chlorine will just naturally burn off add some air stones in there, bubble it away. But if you use city water, just know that you're always going to have to have a tank filled with water to top off whenever you need to add water to your system or in an emergency where you need to do a water exchange. And examples of when you would do a water exchange, your ammonia shoots too high for some reason. And your fish are, you've got 10, 12 dying one right after the other. You've got to get fresh water into them now. So you're going to pull out some of that water with a pump, dump it on the ground, and you're going to put fresh water in. Well water is safe and does not have chlorine, but again, I'm going to always urge you to test your well water. We use well water. We had to have it tested because we live around a bunch of traditional farmers. We needed to make sure that there was nothing in our well water and we were good to go. How do I check these parameters, you say? Well, guess what? There's a test kit for that. If you ever had an aquarium, you know about the test kits, right? Um, this API one is one that's very popular. It tests for all, all these different parameters. Um, the DO, I would recommend a meter. Um, you can buy those meters. Um, or there is another fancy meter that you can get that will test all these, these parameters too that you can invest in. 
And again, you're going to check for the ammonia, the dissolved oxygen, the nitrites, nitrates, and pH. When you first start up your system, don't freak out because you're always going to have ammonia and nitrite spikes. It's just a given. And that's why there are several different ways that you can start your system cycling. I'm not going to go into that here because that's a really lengthy discussion. But one of the easiest ways to cycle your system is to fill it by bottles of live bacteria. You can get them from um, a company called Pentair. Dump it into your system and let it do its job. It will just eventually start start eating up the, you know, it comes, live bacteria is already there, but it's going to produce ammonia, it's going to produce nitrites, you're going to see those spikes. Once you get through those spikes and you start seeing nitrates come on and they start getting more and more and more, your system is, is cycling. So you're going to be able to add your fish soon. Once you add your fish, you're going to not feed them so that you don't add to the ammonia, but you'll see another little spike in that, but it won't be severe. Just a couple more water quality points to watch. Um, everybody always says, okay, what else do we have to add? You know, Brad adds other chemicals. One of the things that we notice is iron and iron deficiency, depending on what we're growing. Some plants need more, some plants need less. So we can add chelated iron, and you can add some, follow the directions on the box for however many gallons of water you have, and then add some, wait a day or two, and if you don't see the plant starting to green up again, add a little bit more. Other than those things, that we do not add anything else to our system. However, I say we don't add, we don't intentionally add, well, say, oh, this we need to add. In our, our media that we grow in, we do add vermiculite to help hold moisture while those seeds are starting to germinate. We also add a little bit of calcium um, oyster shell grit because oyster shell grit is calcium and it will dissolve slowly. So it's not like we're adding it here or there as needed. It's just in there. Because fish food does not offer that to fish. Don't know why fish might need calcium. Anybody, anybody can answer that? Let me know. But, um, but we don't really see like, oh, you know, a plant has a real calcium deficiency. Sometimes you'll see what's called tip burn, it's, but that really is calcium deficiency because the plant's growing so fast. Um, but by just adding these oyster shell grits to that media really has prevented a lot of that. So a lot of questions, what type of fish can I use? You know, these guys have talked about, um, you know, what they use, tilapia. You know, done a lot of research with tilapia. I will tell you 99% of aquaponics farmers use tilapia because that is what, in all, the, all of the stuff you hear, everybody uses tilapia. The people we learned from, they use tilapia. We thought we were going to use tilapia until we came down here. And we took a workshop on what type of fish you can grow in Ohio and found out you have to have their water temperature high for them to survive. And when you're growing in a greenhouse and you're growing for profit and you realize I now have to heat that water in the winter to a higher temperature, it's going to cost me money. Now let's look for a different fish that maybe we don't have to keep that temperature so high. I mean, think about it. Think if you had to keep your home 85 degrees all winter long and how much that would cost you in a heating bill, whether you're buying propane, wood, coal, natural gas. Same thing. You can buy heat tank heaters to heat your water, your tank water and your, for your fish. They are not efficient. I will be the first one to tell you that. First year we used them, my electric bill tripled in the first month because they are not very efficient. See, I'm shaking his head back there. You understand? 
Um, so there are many fish that can be used in aquaponics. So don't just limit yourself to tilapia. You know, they're commonly used. We talked about the water temperature. They tolerate a lower water quality. So they will tolerate some of those shifts in temperature and the higher ammonia and higher nitrates and lower dissolved oxygen. They're omnivores, so you can feed them fish pellets. You can um, feed them duckweed. You can feed them, you know, veggies from your system. They'll eat the roots of your plants. So don't put them where you're growing plants. Um, it takes them about eight to nine months to grow out to what they call plate size, which is fillable. Yellow perch. I will be the first person to say, do yellow perch. <laughs> Honestly, I knew nothing about fish before we did this. And we took this workshop and I learned, you know, trout has to have cold water. Well. <laughs> Don't think your lettuce is going to like that. Um, I also found out that there are some fish that they're cannibalistic and they'll eat each other. So you could lose your fish. So I, I, I'm going to say yellow perch. But anyway, they're good in recirculating systems. Um, they like that cooler water. We keep actually in the wintertime, Doug, what do we keep our water temperature at? And they do, they thrive well. What? 65. Um, the thing about perch, they want good water quality. They do not tolerate when one of those boundaries goes out. They will let us know. And they want their water moving fast. And what, it, what I mean by that, you're recircula recirculating your water in your system. They want that water in their tank exchanged at least once an hour. That's part of that water quality. Um, they just eat the common fish pellet foods. And it takes them about 12 months to grow out the plate size, the label size. I will share with you right now, Doug and I, um, we have switched feed to a feed that's less soybean and more of a fish meal. And they're digesting it better, which means we're having cleaner water. And they're growing a little faster for us. So, kind of our own little experiment, guys. <laughs> You want our you want our data? Let us know. Okay. <laughs> Hybrid striped bass. We've had a couple of people try try this, and they've had a little bit of success with it. It's just really hard to get to get the fingerlings right now on these, as well as the perch. But um, you know they're across. Um, as a hybrid, they have a greater tolerance to all of those temperature changes and DO. They are um, carnivores. They'll eat the fish meal and the pellets takes them a little bit longer to grow out. However, they are so popular with chefs, you could sell them as soon as they're ready. Like, you could just say to a chef, hey, I have 20 striped bass that are ready to be filleted. Do you want them? And they will jump on them. You probably get a good price for them, too. And I am speaking from experience on that, as far as like what chefs want. I've worked with a lot of chefs. They are they're always asking me, hey, can I get this fish? Can I get that fish? Koi, goldfish, carp, good pond fish. Um, if you don't like fish and you're not get, you know, you're doing this for yourself and your family, but you don't want to eat the fish, not a bad way to go, especially if you have kids because they're pretty to look at and the kids, they will almost um, become pets, when you, especially when you feed them like our, we do have a tank of koi that we have gained over the years um, after doing displays at the Ohio State Fair, where we always used koi because the colors show up better, um, especially for the kids, they love to see them. So we've just kept those. We didn't just flush them down the toilet. Um, they, they, you walk over, they immediately all come to you because they know it's like, somebody's here. They're gonna get a feed. If I swim around real pretty, they'll give me feed. They're not, they're not stupid fish. They're, they're, like, they're a lot like um, perch as far as water temperature. They're omnivorous. The flake or the pellet food, they love bugs, plant, plant root. We learn the hard way. We put them in this IBC tote that was attached to the system for a while. And we needed to grow more lettuce. I'm like, hey, we can get two more rafts on top of this. Let's just start growing lettuce on here. 
Well, the lettuce started growing, but then it stopped growing. And I'm like, what is wrong with this? And I picked it up, and there were no roots on the plants because the goldfish were eating them. Duh. I learned the hard way. Um, a lot of koi is sold for pets. There's a show based on the color, shape, scale patterns. They can be kind of expensive to buy. If you're going to use them for an aquaponic system, I would suggest you just buy standard-looking koi at, at an aquarium store. Or there are a couple of fish farmers in Ohio that do deal in koi. You can get them for, you know, a couple bucks. Some with the right pattern can be up to $30,000. So, yeah, you don't want to use that in your aquaponic system. Um, once you take on having fish in your system, you have to look for their health. You, you are their caretaker. They can't go to the doctor and say, this is wrong. They are prey animals and are easily environmentally stressed. And that stress can occur any, from anything. Rapid temperature changes, too much DO, too much ammonia, um, moving them, handling them, moving them in the wrong temperature. When they become stressed, they become more susceptible to disease. Um, and that is why when we take in fish, um, our, a new batch of fish, before we put them in our system, we have to isolate them. They go into, into the um, isolation tank. And they get treated with a salt bath because the salt helps their immune system. It also will kill off anything that might be hanging on their, their mucus that could be bad. Um, and if any one of them start to show distress, you know, they start swimming on their side or they're upside down, they come out immediately because whatever is affecting them could affect the other fish. So you want to get it out of there as fast as you can. Um, if they're stressed, they may not eat. We'll have a couple of days where, you know, Doug will walk out there and he'll come back and he goes, the fish aren't eating. I'm like, really? Like, yeah. Why? Oh. We go through that thing. So then we, you know, we talk it through. And then we'll look at the weather and realize there's a storm coming. That will stress the fish out. The, the difference in the barometric pressures, I guess. My advice, keep your fish happy and healthy. And you won't have any problems. Plants, you can grow just about anything. Um, a lot of these pictures that have plants that are being grown, we have grown them. We have grown some of them by mistake, but it was a nice mistake. Such as our beets here. You know, this is a root crop. And I suggested root crops in media beds. Guess what? You can, you can grow them in deep water culture. They just come out looking really oblong <laughs> um, because of the, the, the base you use. Um, but yeah, Swiss chard, collard greens, bok choy, baby bok choy was really super popular. Um, cucumbers, zucchini, squashes, broccoli, we grew broccoli. All sorts of uh, green beans, purple green beans, sugar snap peas, strawberries, you saw the strawberries. You can grow just about anything. Um, people say, well, what, what do you plant, you know? A lot of times the advice is, look at the zone we're in. What would we grow naturally, you know, in the ground? If you can grow it here in the ground, you can grow it in an aquaponic. You know, you have some long-term fruiting vegetable plants, you know, like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, herbs. Um, tomatoes, I will tell you, are very labor-intensive in an aquaponic system um, because, you know, you have to vine them, trellis them. You have to, you know, prune the sucker plants off. That can be very tedious, and it can also add weight. So if you do traditional tomatoes, if you really want to do it, I would recommend a media bed or a Dutch bucket, which is kind of like a vertical. Um, but a cherry tomato plant grows really good in aquaponics system, and they are so sweet. They're great plants. Um, and do your quick turn plant you know, crops. The, the, although I put broccoli up here, it's not really that quick turn. It takes a while, but you know now it's the baby broccoli. 
you'd be good there. Lettuce, kale, collards, herbs, basil. You can even grow watermelon, although I, I would recommend it probably in a media bed. Things like kale, herbs, basil, that can be what we call a cut and come again. So you're harvesting just leaves off of them. You're not harvesting the whole plant. Like with lettuce, you're going to harvest the whole head of lettuce. So you kind of get more bang for your buck when you do a cut and come again, um, especially like if you're doing basil. Fresh basil grown aquaponically that you can claim, just naturally grown, no pesticides, will get you a high dollar with restaurants. Again, the, the plants just hang out. And those roots just wick up the nutrients as the water flows by. But sometimes the root mass can be a little big, depending on what you're growing. So one thing I learned when we first started this, because again, I knew nothing about fish. I knew nothing about growing in a garden. But I was taught that whatever you see above the ground, the root system below the ground is just as big. So we grew <laughs> Swiss chard. And Swiss chard is the cut and come again. And we left it in there and we just, you know, harvest off of it, harvest off of it. And one day it's like something is clogging up the sandpipe in this bed. And so we're looking and we realize there is this huge root mass going down in this sandpipe that's over making the bed overflow, basically. Doug cut it off. It was from a Swiss chard plant, and that's how big it was. One plant. Crazy. So seeds, you could start in seed trays. You don't have to start them like actually in your system. In fact, you probably don't want to because you'll lose the seeds if you do. So we start ours in seed trays. And our media, which you know you can see, I was going to point up there, but I'll see here. This is core. And core is the outside husk of a coconut. And it's ground up really super fine. So it's almost like dirt. In fact, when we open the bag, and you take a big sniff, it almost smells like that fresh dirt smell. And then we mix it with that vermiculite, a little bit of vermiculite, and a little bit of those oyster shell grits. We fill the trays, we plant the seeds, we put them in a tray, we water it. Yes, we use water from the system to water it. We let the water soak up from the bottom, not from the top. And then just let them germinate. And then once they germinate, we put them into these little cups, they're called net pots. They have little slits in them, and that's what goes into the raft in, in the system so that the root's hanging down, down below. Sorry, I'm running late, guys. <laughs> You're going to deal with pests, many kinds of pests. Um, try to avoid them by spacing your plants out, planting companion plants. Um, for example, alyssum um, is a banking plant that you can grow and it, every so often so that it'll help, um, what about, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, it, the, the aphids will, will not like it, so they won't come to the plants nearby. Beneficial insects. We use tens of thousands of ladybugs every summer. Um, they eat aphids like crazy, and keep them, keep them at bay. Green lace wings also. We did have a praying mantis in there a couple of years ago. Um, we thought, oh, we'll use that. No, he'll eat the ladybug, the lace wings, and the spiders. So I, I put him up there just to tell you that little story. I wouldn't recommend him. Sometimes you just get so overrun, you have to take care of something. So we had had a real problem with a diamondback moth laying its eggs, and we get these little green caterpillars. We've tried everything to get rid of them. beneficial insects. That's always our first go-to. If we can't do beneficial insects, then we'll use a biologic. One is called dipole. It's a powder that you mix into a water and spray on. It's not harmful to fish or humans, um, but it is to that little caterpillar. Or a compound BT has that big, long name. Um, same thing. Um, we also use di diametaceous earth. DE to help reduce the ant traffic because they're the ones, you know, that um, they they harvest the aphids up out of the ground and put them on the plants and stroke them so that they'll let that 
juice out that they like so much. So that's a whole nother insect story and lesson. So, <laughs> so who are we? I kind of already told you we're Fresh Harvest Farm. That's our first greenhouse. Um, where we started, 2011. Um, Doug had been researching what he wanted to do. We decided to do aquaponics. Um, we started with one greenhouse that was 35 feet wide, 72 feet long, had about a little over 1,200 square foot of grow space, six 12 inch deep grow beds, 352 feet, 260, 172 feet long, and one tank of perch. 1,400 gallons and had 2,000 fingerlings in it. Our growth space was o over 1,600 plants that we could grow. That's the picture of our first greenhouse. And this isn't even where it, when all the plants were in. Because as you can see, at the ends here, they're still empty. And this whole trough has nothing in it yet because we hadn't gotten enough plants in it. Why aquaponics for us? We were looking for a retirement business so Doug could retire. Um, he had always wanted a small greenhouse. We thought, well, why not grow something and sell it, right? Um, he had thought about hydroponics. He looked into it. He didn't like some of the things that you had to do. He found aquaponics on the internet, like I'm sure a lot of you have. A lot of people ask us, how did you learn to do what you do, what you're doing? internet, workshops like this, um, books. We made business partner partnerships with local associations like the Ohio Aquaculture Association. We have invested time in partnerships in our county and the state extension offices and OSU down here. Our local garden center, they're so funny. You go in there and it's like, what's wrong with my plant? And you take a leaf in, and they're like, well, you need to add it. It's like, OK, is that safe for fish? And they're like, why? And then you explain to them what they're doing, and they're like, I can't help you. But if you start educating them, they start learning about it. So when you come in the next time, they do, do have an answer for you. Local hydroponic stores are really a good resource, believe it or not. I mean, they don't do aquaponics. They do hydroponics. but they, they are very much aware that it's very similar. And networking with other farmers. Doug and I have always had an open policy. We share information. We will tell you what we've done wrong so you don't do it. We're not going to let you do it. If you call me up and say, you know, hey, we just built our system and we have 12,000 perch and da 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 da, and I'm going to ask you, do you have a, a, a backup generator to operate your electricals should the electricity go out? And you'll probably tell me no, and I'm going to say, invest in one immediately. 20 minutes of no electric with 12,000 perch or any type of fish, you, you're going to lose them all. Why? We've done it. <laughs> it's happened to us. What we've grown, you've seen some of the pictures. Here's some more. Um, the squashes. Celery. We've grown celery in both a media bed and in the deep water culture. It tastes great. We did a taste test with some preschoolers. Store-bought celery, our celery. Preschoolers all chose the store-bought celery. All of the parents and teachers chose our celery. Any idea why? Because they don't know any different. That's all they've ever had. So, purple reams. Our biggest crop right now that we have a demand for is kale. Dinosaur, Luciano kale. Um, we currently serve four restaurants in Columbus, and that's all they want. We can't grow enough of it. Where do we sell? Um, we did started out doing farmer's markets like crazy. I mean, sometimes in the summertime, we'd be at five markets a week. In the wintertime, two markets a week. Um, restaurants. Biggest clients are our restaurants. When a, a local restaurant, locally owned restaurant, local chefs find out about your product and how good it is, they will continue to buy it. 
they will ask you to grow specific things. Fish, we sell them to other fish farmers, pond and lake management companies, or restaurants. Right now, um, somebody had told me they were just up at Lake Erie and told me that perch was going for $27.99 a pound, which I thought was crazy. And so I don't know if it's true or not, but they, I mean, they seem like somebody I can trust. You know, it was $17.99 a pound at the local fish market here in Columbus. So, interesting. Live on, live on ice. We do not have the, the processing facility or the license to fillet them out. So we sell them live. So our restaurants, I take them live on ice. Well, they're not live when they get there, but you know, because the, the, the ice does what it does. And they have to fillet them out. So if they do not know how to fillet them out, I do know another fish farmer who does have the processing facility and will charge him a nominal fee to fillet them for him. So, a lot of people ask, how much time does it take? You know, once you start an aquaponic system, it's not a like, okay, set it up, feed the fish, and, and go away for a week. I mean, you do have to you do have to pay attention to it, especially in the very very beginning. Um, but once you get established, like Doug and I, I mean, we actually took a week vacation. We had people that could come take care of it for us, check in on it. We were able to take a vacation. But it, it all depends on the size of your operation and what other things you do. Like we do tours. We just did three coach bus tours um, of senior citizens on mystery bus tours. It was so much fun. Um, it depends on the time of year and you know your your schedule that you have to be on for you know planting and harvesting and deliveries and all that. You know, best advice: establish a routine. As soon as you get it going and you know what you're doing, where you're selling. Establish your routine. If you're making deliveries, make that delivery one or two. Like at one point, I was delivering three days a week, but they were it was on my schedule when I could deliver, not when they wanted it, and they were okay with that because they were getting a really good product. Where are we now? <laughs> well, I'm here. Um, we have expanded to, to, meet, to meet the demand. In 2015, we put our second greenhousing system in, 16, our third greenhousing system. We currently have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three, seven tanks of fish. That's 14,000 perch. We are putting in four more tanks of perch because we are actually adding RAS systems that are not coupled to the aquaponics so that we can raise more fish. Um, so we're, we're going a little bit bigger. Um, we have, we tripled our sales in 2016 for the first time and that has maintained that sales level and it's upwards of 80,000, okay? I'll just give you that ballpark. <laughs> And we main, we've been maintaining that until last year. And of course, last year threw everybody through a curve. So we are not back there yet. It's going to take us time again to get back up there because it's not only us, but it's our customer who has to, you know, they just, they didn't stay open for takeout when they could. When they were allowed to have outdoor dining, they did not. That's when they opened for takeout. And when they were allowed, to, when they decided, okay, we'll let people indoors when they could, there are such small, unique restaurants that they went from, you know, 12 tables maybe to six. So they're still doing a good carryout business, but their their sales are not up. They're they're up, but not to where they were pre-pandemic. So. And I ran a little bit over. Sorry, guys. Thank you for having me.